Let's see whether there are questions on any of the materials so far. Let's start with that. Any questions that anybody wants to ask? No? Yes. So, uh, the scattering thing. Yes. In principle, that's right, yes, yeah. Um, uh, so, that doesn't mean that the, um, that the, the neutron would stick around the, the nucleus for a long time, right? I mean, you can have, it, it, it's only if it were, it, it doesn't get trapped around the nucleus. It just, basically what it affects is the phase of the, of the neutron as it goes out. Right, uh, relative to the phase of the wave that comes in. Um, it, it really, for most scattering purposes, there's, as I say, most of them are positive. And so you, 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 the only time you really have to even consider it is in the case of hydrogen, which is negative to do in SANS, for example. Uh, you have to remember that and put that in. And which brings us to this topic which is that of, of um, scattering length density, which, is, uh, which we met already when we were talking about the average potential of a material uh, for the, 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 when neutrons go into it, what the average potential they see is. Um, remember, this, this uh, differential scattering cross-section has this um, form uh, where this is just the nuclear particle density in the material, and you have to ask yourself what happens if Q is very small now, because we're look, talking about small angle scattering. And if Q is very small, of course, this phase factor is very small. It doesn't vary very much between the different nuclei. And so basically, you can add all the nuclei, the scattering lengths of all the nuclei up, and you don't have to worry about the phase between them over some coarse grained volume. Uh, and so uh, this average of the scattering length over some volume, let's say a molecule, is called the scattering length density of the molecule. So how do you calculate that? One way to do it is to you know, flog through Avogadro's number and uh, punch numbers into a computer, into a calculator. The easy way to do it is to go to the NIST website, uh, which is given here, and you will find something like this. Actually, this is the old version, so the new version is a little simpler. And basically, all you do is you put in your uh, formula for your compound. You have to go away and look up the density. Uh, that's easy because you can Google it. Uh, and then the wavelength that it asks for it doesn't matter because the scattering length density doesn't change with wavelength. Uh, this is a, uh, um, a calculator that allows you to do both X-ray and neutron, so it probably does matter in that case. And then uh, it will, once you enter the density and the formula, it will spit out for you the, the, the neutron scattering length density. Um, and I told you it was generally, this is a very small one, and it's very small because, because it's got 12 hydrogens, which are, which are negative, sort of um, counterbalancing the six uh, carbons. But in general, the number you get will be something like 10 to the minus 6. Uh, so you have x-ray values. It also tells you what the background is in your SANS experiment. Um, now, here's a confusion. Remember what I told you was that this um, differential cross-section is measured in length squ is squared, right? It's b squared. b is a length, so it's a length squared. So how come... Uh, it gives you this background in this cr crazy unit. Well, the, the reason is that this is a background per unit volume of the sample. So it's length squared divided by length cubed, so it comes out in length to the minus one. So, so you will see in SANS experiments, when you look at the intensity, the intensity scale, which is the vertical scale always in these plots, if the, if the experiment has been done carefully and is in absolute intensity, which it can be, and it can be because the neutron interacts weakly, uh, and so you can actually do quantitative calculations of the uh, 
of the of the scattering cross section, you will see that often given in centimeters to the minus one. And what that means is it's d sigma d omega, the, s the differential uh, cross section, divided by the volume of the sample for, for which th that it's been calculated. So it gives you that. It will also give you the one over E length of neutrons going through your sample. And that tells you how thick, in some cases, to make your sample. So you'll see if you have a lot of hydrogen in your sample, for example, you've got a colloid dispersed or polymer dispersed in water, you'll see this is a very small number because there's a, a lot of incoherent scattering from the water. So the, the, the beam has trouble getting through the, through the sample. So, so from this website, the NIST website, you can, you can get a lot of information for planning your experiment. Uh, you can then go on uh, to actually, I don't think I have it here, but um, yeah, I don't have it here, but the, you can go on on that website and calculate what your scattering will look like from a number of different models. So if you have, for example, I don't know, micelles, which have polar head groups on the outside and aliphatic tails on the inside. You can work out what the scattering length densities are using this and then put in a simple model of a core shell particle uh, and calculate what the scattering will look like. Um, the scattering for, the, the, this looks complicated, but it really isn't. This is the scattering uh, cross section. It's a ubiquitous thing that we keep coming back to. What does it look like for SANS? Well, it has a form factor in it. That form factor is just the sum of the, f of the uh, phase factors that we know and love over whatever the, whatever the particle is that you're thinking about in your, in your system. So to be concrete, imagine that you have a, a uh, sample which is a D2O with a bunch of colloidal particles in it, uh, spherical colloidal particles then what this form factor is, is just this phase factor averaged over this particle, so in this case a sphere, and you'll see what that is in a minute, squared. This, um, this angular bracket here is an orientational average. So for a sphere, it doesn't matter. But if your particle is something like this, it does matter because it'll be tumbling around uh, in, in the liquid, and the actual form factor will depend upon what this, the orientation of this is because what the orientation of Q is with respect to the length of this molecule, and you have to do that orientational average if you haven't uh, aligned the molecules in some way. So, so that's this thing, the form factor, and that, has, that is just something which specifies the structure of the thing you're looking at with, with small angle neutron scattering. There's a factor here which is just a, a contrast of scattering lengths. So this is the scattering length density of your particle, let's say your colloidal particle in D2O. And this is the scattering length density of the background, D2O. So obviously the scattering is going to depend, the amount of scattering is going to depend upon the contrast between your, your uh, container, your fluid, carrier fluid, and the particle that you have in it. So, and, and it depends as the square. Just as we've seen before, it's B squared, so it's going to turn out to be uh, difference of uh, scattering length density squared. There's some normalization crap in here, which is the volume of the particle squared and the particle density. You'd expect it to depend upon the, the, the number of particles in the sample, right? Because it's, uh, the scattering is from all the particles. And then there's this piece here, which is just the Fourier transform of the pair correlation function. And we saw that when we were looking at this uh, scattering from a monatomic fluid. Remember, I showed you argon. Uh, that there was this thing called the static pair distribution function, which was Fourier transformed, that, can, that was part of the expression for the um, uh, differential cross-section. So every term in this is a term you've met before, just written in a slightly different form. So uh, it, it's not, uh, it's not a really that hard. There's some you know, derivation here, but, but it's, you could almost write it down by inspection. Um, so that's what you measure. Um, if you, one thing that you can often measure with SANS is uh, the shape of a particular particle or a molecule. Um, if, you, if you make the molecules, the, the particles dilute enough, that, for example, let's come back to our, our D2O with colloidal particles in it, then 
uh, if you make them dilute enough, they, are no, they not, don't know about each other. If they don't know about each other, there's no correlation function. It's just one. And so this, this term here goes to one. And the only thing that you're measuring is essentially the, the form factor of the particle uh, and this contrast factor. So you, you can use um, uh, small angle scattering to deduce information about particles of uh, dimensions, let's say, 10 nanometers to a few hundred nanometers in, in size using, using this technique where you have the particles fairly far apart. Um, and then there are, some, uh, there are some scaling things that you can get out of it. You can get out the molecular weight of the object that's doing the scattering from, from these things. Um, if, you if you know the particle is, is spherical, for example, it's very easy to write down what the, f the, f the form factor is. You can do it just by simple integration. Uh, and, uh, and in that case, you get a function for the form factor before you square it, which is this form factor. And remember in the, in the expression for the intensity, I've written it as I of Q here, but it's exactly the same thing as this. Right? So this is, this is the differential cross-section, which is often written as uh, I of Q, the intensity as a function of Q, same thing. Uh, and for a spherical particle, you can just write it down. Uh, this is the um, form factor, and it's going to be squared, so it's going to look like this. Right, that's what it's going to look like in the scattering. Yes? Back a couple of slides, yeah. Correct. Uh, so it's not it's not seeing uh, it's not seeing individual. Um, so it, it's not seeing individual uh, atoms or individual nuclei, because the distance between nuclei, let's say, is of the order of a few angstroms, and Q is of the order of let's say ten to the minus two angstroms. To the minus one, so that phase factor is very small. And if I if I go to another nucleus inside the uh, inside the molecule, it's still very small. So I can basically put the whole phase factor equal to one and just add up the scattering uh, without because all the phase factors are one basically, because Q is small enough relative to the the interparticle distances that the phase factor just goes to one. Okay. Now, uh, you said something about excitation. Let me s and make sure I didn't miss a part of your question. Yeah, you mentioned the nuclear phase factor. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> um, so, uh, this is, this is th 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 yeah, OK. So uh, there's a lot that I pushed under the rug here. I've, um, uh, uh, most people who do um, uh, small angle neutron scattering will assume that it's all elastic scattering and that there's no inelastic scattering, there are no excitations. Um, for most of the types of experiments, like for example, a colloidal particle in D2O or, or a, um, a polymer blend or something, most of that, um, I you assume it's a, you're measuring a static. Now, to be honest, the, the 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 small angle scattering gets done at or has been in the past done by rea at reactors. There's no way they can tell whether it's elastic or inelastic because they just take the neutrons going in, and they measure all the neutrons coming out, and they assume that they're elastic. That's not true if you do it at a pulse source because you have at the timing information, so you can tell. Uh, so a, a lot of people over the years have worried about these experiments being done for example, of particles in water, and worried about the inelastic scattering. But since they couldn't measure it, they decided it wasn't important. Uh, it, it, it turns out that in certain circumstances, it is important. Uh, and beginning, people are beginning to realize that now that they can actually see it on, on uh, pulse source instrumentation for measuring small angle scattering. It's a, it's a usual thing, right? If you, if you don't look, you can't see it. 
So uh, where were we? Uh, um, so one of the things you'll see, I mentioned it just now, uh, one of the first things that was uh, measured, uh, or, or important things that was measured by small angle scattering was this thing called the radius of gyration of a polymer, which is basically um, uh, you know, the average of the, um, the squared, uh, so you take the mass of a, a thing times the distance from the center of mass squared and you average that over the, over the, over the molecule, right? And that's the so-called radius of gyration. It's a measure of the size of the object. And you can get that directly out of small angle neutron scattering uh, if you just write down what the, what the f expand the form factor, this thing here, uh, this thing up here, just expand it in terms of uh, at low Q uh, and just, just write down a Taylor expansion of it uh, this this term goes away because uh, um, it, it's 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 anti-symmetric, so it goes to zero when you average, and then you just do this one, and uh, eventually when you do the averaging, you get this thing here, and so the the, the very small q um, in in Sand's experiments, you're essentially measuring something which is uh, proportional to the to the expon an exponential function of the radius of gyration. So. That's, uh, so, so, so what I told you now is that Sands can measure the molecular weight of the of the ob of the object you're looking at by looking at the magnitude of the scattering at q equals zero. And now I've told you that at very small q, it can also measure the some parameter which is the average size of the of the um, uh, item that you're looking at. I don't think I want to bother with this. So. Now you can do an experiment. This was done quite a long time ago. Uh, I don't remember how long now, but back in the, the 70s or 80s, uh, this, is, this was done with, uh, indeed done with uh, beads of uh, polymethyl methacrylate, I think, <coughs> it's dispersed in, in a deuterated solvent. And uh, the first experiment that gets done is the, um, uh, is one in which the particles are very dilute. And then what you see is, this is log of intensity, but it doesn't matter. Uh, what, you, what you are supposed to see is these black curves here, which is just this thing squared. Because right? you've got spherical particles with a form factor. Square this, you'll get something that comes down here, goes up here, goes up here, and so on. And that's exactly this thing here. So these black curve is, is, is the form factor for uh, spherical particles. The, inten the intensity goes to zero in these points here. Uh, and so uh, in, the, in the log plot, it's diving down like this. Uh, um, and uh, it, it's sort of minus infinity here in some sense. Uh, what you actually measure is these um, uh, circular dots. Why do you measure the circular dots and not the solid dots? Resolution, yes. So the so if if you want to measure the if you want to the definition of a radius of gyration as of a particle, find the center of mass, and then take elements of uh, 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 elements in the particle and multiply the mass of the element by the square of the distance away from the, from, the, um, from the center of mass, integrate that over the particle, and divide by the total mass of the object. And that gives you a weighted average of the squared distance, which is called the radius of gyration. Right. No, you're not. Fi so, so if you do radius of gyration, you'll find that the radius of gyration does depend upon the point of which wi the point, of point of origin. And what I'm saying is, put the point of origin at the center of mass of the particle, right? And then 
and then measure the and then okay. So uh, so any other questions? Okay. So so you get this, these open dots. Why do you get these open dots? Resolution. Right. In other words, you don't have a, um, a, a, an infinitely good uh, Q resolution. You can't measure the the change of direction a, as accurately as you would like. And so you measure this, um, uh, these dots. And if you if you if you f uh, fold the, the the theoretical cross section with the resolution that you can calculate, then you can uh, you can figure out what the the radius of the particles is. Uh, if you now um, make the particles more concentrated in the in the dispersion, then the cor then there's going to be correlations between them. Remember, I showed you that correlation function for uh, liquid argon, which ha was zero inside the diameter of the particle and then went like this, right, plotted for you. Uh, if you do that for, for, um, uh, for a, a particle, what you'll find is that the, that the, cross, the, the, the scattering cross-section is a product of two things. And that, uh, let me go back and show you what I mean. Um, it's a product of two things. It's this thing, which is the form factor of the individual particle, times this Fourier transform of the correlation function. Right? So I can measure this by measuring a dilute sample. Uh, I can measure the shape of the particle. And now if I measure a concentrated dispersion, I'll measure the product of the uh, form factor of the particle times this correlation function. Uh, and here, 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 uh, here's what you see. S of Q, remember I told you that that was the Fourier transform of the pair, uh, the static pair distribution function. So that measures the correlations between the particles. And then this is the particle form factor, uh, which, is the, which was the thing we were talking about just immediately before. So sm in, 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 in small angle scattering, you can measure things very similar to what you would measure in a monatomic fluid. Uh, but over different length squares, length scales. So the, 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 the S of Q for argon was measured at much higher Q, much smaller length scales. It's the size of an argon atom. And this is measured at much smaller Q because it's for uh, uh, latex particles, same stuff as you have in water-based paint, uh, right, that, that, uh, that have a size of, uh, I don't know, hundred, a few, few tens of nanometers rather than uh, sub, sub angstrom. So that's, that, uh, whoops, wrong way. I don't want to go through that. So here is a very important concept in, in um, uh, small angle neutron scattering. How many of you think there's grit in toothpaste? Well, there is grit in toothpaste. I mean, you want grit in toothpaste, right? You want to be able to brush your teeth and brush stuff off your teeth. Um, but people don't like looking at gritty toothpaste. So uh, the stuff that the, the grit is, is embedded in is, has the same ref refractive index for light as the grit, and you can't see it. And so here's a demonstration of the same thing. Imagine that you, this, is a, this is a test tube which has in it uh, some glass beads and some glass, uh, so some borosilicate beads and some glass fiber. And if you if you fill the uh, the, the the test tube with with uh, a liquid which has the same refractive index as the glass fiber, you can't see it. Right? You can't see it because there's no there's no contrast in refractive index to scatter the light. Uh, but you can see the the balls because they have a different refractive index for light. Similarly, if you now put uh, um, some liquid in which, which is, has the same refractive index as the balls, but different from the, from the uh, uh, glass fiber, you can see the glass fiber. So you do exactly the same thing uh, with neutrons. Uh, remember there was this contrast term in the scattering cross section, which was the scattering length density of the, of the ball, let's say, minus the scattering length density of the, of the carrier fluid. The, the whole scattering was proportional to that, squared. That's, the, that's called the contrast term. And it's exactly analogous to the, to the optical contrast that you see here. 
And you can use that uh, to, to great effect in, in many small angle scattering uh, ex experiments. Here on this, uh, on this side of the graph is, uh, are the scattering length densities of some typical things that you might run into in biological systems. RNA and DNA, pr typical proteins, sugars, et cetera. And over this side is the, uh, the scattering length density of uh, a carrier fluid, which is made of a, of a mixture of D2O uh, and, uh, and H2O. So at, at, uh, at, some, uh, at some value, uh, when it's all H2O, this is the answer. If it's all D2O, the, the, the answer is up here. And so if you make a mixture of you know, 60, 40, or 30, 10, T, you can, you can match out uh, various parts of molecules that you don't want to see uh, um, and, and look at the structure of the other parts of the molecule. Uh, so this is, this is another way of looking at it as a percent of D2O. Uh, what is the contrast between water with that percentage of D2O and, uh, for example, a lipid head group uh, or a deuterated protein uh, why do you think the protein slopes here? Anybody? Wouldn't you think, wouldn't you expect a protein to have a, a constant scattering length density independent of whether it was placed in water or water plus D2O? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, you do. So you get, you get uh, deuterated deuterons exchanging with the labile protons on the, on the protein. So that's a thing you have to be pay attention to in these in these types of experiments. Uh, the contrast, you, you ha I mean, contrast is great, but you have to think about what uh, the, the thermodynamics is as well sometimes. But anyway, it's a it's a it's a technique that is widely used in in small angle scattering and has been, uh, you know, very successful in in in, uh, in chemistry, polymer chemistry in particular, and in biology. And here are some numbers for, for scattering, length, uh, um, uh, scattering lengths of various things. Nickel's kind of interesting. You can see that some of them are, 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 are negative. So you can actually make magnetic air as far as neutrons are concerned. You can combine various fractions of the different isotopes so there's no nuclear, s no nuclear scattering. So it looks like air, but each one of the uh, um, nuclei is, oh, excuse me, atoms is still magnetic, so it has the magnetic scattering. So if you play with ni uh, nickel, you can make magnetic air for as far as neutrons are concerned. Okay, so this is, I don't know why I was all clicking through, but it, it's pretty obvious if you have m molecules with different um, parts to them uh, and you want to measure, um, you know, the, the, what different parts of a molecule, you can match them out in different ways. Uh, by using different carrier fluids uh, with different concentrations, so that you see different uh, different scattering, and from those different scatterings, you can deduce the structures of the individual parts of the molecule. Um, so I told you the scattering you get a very small Q. That was Guinea region. You measure the radius of gyration. Uh, there's also a region where at higher Q, where the scattering goes as uh, Q to the minus four for any particle which has a smooth surface. Um, and that's called the Porod region. And in measuring that, you can measure something about the area of the particle that you're, you're scattering from. So I've told you you can measure its mass, its radius of gyration, and now it's the area, the surface area of a particle that's suspended in a fluid. Um, it doesn't go as, as Q to the minus four if the surface is fractal. Uh, or if the um, or uh, or or if the particle itself is a mass fractal, so be careful. If you see if you see if you're doing a, a Sands experiment, and you go up to high Q and you plot the log of the scattering against Q, and the slope isn't minus four, you have some sort of fractal in your system, and uh, there are ways of deducing what the fractal dimension is uh, from the slope. On the other hand, if the if there's a, if it's curved then you're probably not measuring a fractal. You need to have a, it needs to be a straight line. Uh, so here are, the, here are these, here, here's what you measure. Zero intercept will give you um, particle volume. Guinea region gives you a size. Uh, 
uh, this sort of region might give you a mass fractal dimension, and in the polar rod region up at high IQ, you'll get this surface fractal dimension or the slope of minus four, uh, which if, this, if the particle is, is, is smooth. So you can get a lot of information out of uh, um, SANS experiments. They're very powerful. They're probably, it's probably the type of experiment that most or uh, the largest number of users, I guess, in, in, uh, in neutron scattering. And uh, that's not true in, in X-ray scattering. Probably the largest single block of users in that case is protein crystallography. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about surface reflection. We did mention it earlier. I told you that neutrons could be externally reflected from, from a surface. And somebody asked me about measuring thin films. Uh, and um, the, this fact that neutrons can reflect externally from materials is used both in designing instrumentation because you can make uh, neutron guides, that is to say, a long tube with very smooth sides such that the neutrons will just bounce off the sides as they go down the, the guide and not be lost. So you, you beat the inverse uh, square law that way, right? Uh, but there's a limit to what you can do because there's a limit to the 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 angle that the neutron can make for to the, with the surface and still be reflected. This this sort of specular reflection is called a specular reflection because the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, so it's specular. It can be used to make m m monochromators for X-rays, for example, or so-called supermirrors uh, for for uh, neutron polarizers. And probably Lee Robin Robertson will talk about that in the, next, uh, in the next lecture. And it can also be used in scientific investigations to investigate surface and interface structure uh, of, of, of these types. So if you have a bunch of layers, for example, it, this, this thing is exactly the same as oil on a puddle. Right? If you have a thin layer of oil on a puddle, you'll see a bunch of colors. right? And the colors will depend on the thickness of the oil. It's just interference between the reflection from the top surface of the oil and the bottom surface of the oil. That's exactly what you do with neutron reflectivity. You measure the, the interference between neutrons that are reflected from these uh, various interfaces. And that interference pattern tells you uh, about the, the thicknesses of the layers. You have to be careful with reflection because it isn't weak scattering. By definition, if it's, if it's full specular reflection, then the amount of intensity you get off is equal to the amount of intensity that you've, you, you've shown on the sample. That's not weak. So you have to be very careful about how you do the calculation and the, the, the kinematic approximation. It doesn't work. Uh, you can, you can, we, I told you that you could, you could work out a refractive index. Uh, uh, the neutrons obey Snell's law, um, and so there is a critical external reflection uh, below a certain angle, and that's called, and that angle below which there is perfect reflection from a surface is called a critical angle. It's very small. Um, if you take a, a single element, nickel has the highest value. Uh, for the, uh, the critical angle. And the critical angle is about 0.1 times the wavelength of the neutron in, in angstrom, so, and, and it results in degrees. So if you have a four angstrom neutron, then the critical angle is 0.4 degrees. So it's a, it's a very small, from nickel. So it's a very small angle, uh, and, and for a long time, the only guides that were available, neutron guides that were available, were made with glass, with nickel coating on them. Uh, glass, because you can make glass very flat, and so uh, you can get uh, perfect specular reflection. So this is how you calculate the critical angle. I'm not going to go into it, or I'll never get done here. But um, let's not worry about that. Uh, this, is, this is, again, how you calculate the reflection angle. I won't go into that. Um, below the, ref uh, the, the critical reflection angle, uh, of course, the, the wave going, the wave inside the material is evanescent because the, the neutron is being, um, uh, being reflected from the surface. So the penetration depth is small. 
So in principle, if you're below the critical angle, you can measure um, uh, uh, only surface effects, phenomena, phenomena, layers, or what do I want to say, depths very close to the surface. So here's the this is the penetration depth as a function of angle versus the critical angle. So this is the critical angle here, uh, one times the critical angle, this is two times the critical angle. And you can see the penetration depth is very small below the critical angle, and then it shoots up dramatically at the critical angle. So if you're making measurements with angle where, where you come into the sample at an angle below the critical angle, you can measure, your measurement will, will be sensitive only to the first few atomic layers of the sample. Um, here's, a, here's a measurement of the reflectivity of, I think it's water, isn't it? Uh, yeah, uh, water. So what does reflectivity um, look like? So if you, if you measure uh, the reflectivity of, um, let's say, water um, uh, with x-rays rather than neutrons, which you could do it with neutrons, what happens is the reflectivity is one. That means all of the x-rays that are incident on the sample are reflected back uh, for angles below the critical angle. So here, this is, this is the critical reflection region, the, the, uh, the total, the total reflection in that region. And then beyond that, uh, the, reflection, the reflectivity of the surface drops dramatically. You can see this is a log scale. So out here, we're in at 10 to the minus five reflectivity of the surface. 10 to the minus five of the neutrons are reflected at an angle, uh, at, th at this angle. That, that, that uh, curve goes as one over Q to the fourth. It's the same as the behavior of the Porod scattering that I pointed out to you in SANS, right, at high, at high Q. Uh, and, and, and for the same reason, it's just uh, uh, if you, when you calculate it out, that's, that's what, you got, what you get in three dimensions. Uh, and and it's, uh, for the same reasons, it's just the dimension of the integral. Um, the, de the, the measurements don't follow it, right? You can see this is measurements made with x-rays of the reflectivity of a water surface. Uh, why is that? Why don't they follow this, um, this nice curve that you can calculate so easily by doing uh, um, matching of boundary conditions? Well, the reason is that the, the surface of water isn't completely smooth. Even if you have water on an anti-vibration system so that it doesn't, I mean, you can't shake it. If you shake it, you get waves on it. But even if you, uh, you know, damp out all the vibrations, you get um, capillary waves on the surface of water, which are um, a result of the fact that it's at a finite temperature and, and, and uh, has a finite uh, surface tension. And that creates a roughness of the surface, and the, and the roughness um, decreases the specular reflectivity. Uh, it's exactly the same as you would see if you had, if all of these walls were made of mirrors, uh, you know, there'd be a lo lot greater reflection from them than, than, it, than, it, than there is when they're made of wood. Because the wood is, is, is rough and, and, diff and diffusively reflects the light. This is the sa exactly the same thing here. If you're doing this experiment in which you're uh, measure looking at re specular reflectivity, but some of the, some of the x-rays are going off into different directions uh, in diffuse scattering, and that reduces the spe specular reflectivity. Um, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this either. Um, so if you have a rough surface, let's supposing the, the surface is rough, you can uh, calculate what the, what the reflectivity ought to would be for such a rough surface. It's this Fresnel reflectivity, this thing that goes down as one over Q to the fourth times the damping factor. Um, that was um, um, first deduced, I think, by some French guys in, I want to say, the 1980s or something like that. It's not, it's, it's quite recent. Uh, so we understand how the specular reflectivity is damped uh, by, by the presence of roughness of a surface. So you can, in principle, use neutrons not only to measure the thicknesses of layers, but also the roughnesses of the interfaces, interfaces between the layers. Um, this is just an example of what uh, 
the, the you get from a reflectivity measurement if you have a film on top of a substrate. If you only had the, the substrate, you would get this. And then if you put the film on top of it, you, you get this uh, thing here. And the distance between these, these nodes, it, it just immediately uh, tells you the thickness of the film. So um, it, 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 it's a very good way of measuring um, film thicknesses. And you can do the calculation for all sorts of structures with many layers. It's, it's, uh, it's a, 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 a bore to do, but it isn't hard. And uh, you don't even have to do it because you can get a program, a computer program to do it. And, and you know, why bother to, to you know, flog yourself to death trying to do something you can use a canned program to, to calculate. And then, and then, of course, you can slice up if you, have a if you have some layers which have a, a gradation of scattering length density rather than being just a particular scattering length density, then you can slice up this, this, the layer into little thinner layers, each of which has a constant scattering length density. So this direction here is perpendicular to the layer. Imagine the layers on a substrate. Perpendicular to it is the z direction. And I've got some variation of the scattering length density in the z direction, which is this dotted curve, say, I can make it up after, uh, from a bunch of layers of, d of uh, different constant uh, scattering length densities, and I can solve this layer problem just by plugging it into a computer. Uh, so, so I can do sort of arbitrarily complex layers, and I don't want to go through that either. Here's an example. Um, to compare x-rays and neutrons just to give you a feel for it. This is a situation in which there is um, a, a silicon uh, 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 substrate, it's a big a thick silicon wafer, and on top of that one has a deuterated polyvinyl pyridine layer, uh, 70 angstroms thick, and here's a hydrogenated polystyrene layer, 210 ang angstroms thick. So let's measure that with x-rays and with neutrons. If you measure it in reflectivity now, you're measuring the, 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 the reflectivity. Here's the reflectivity curve that you measure with x-rays. It just has these wiggles like this. Why does it have that? Well, the scattering length density of silicon has some value, but the scattering length density of the two polymers are very closely similar because the electron density in the two polymers is very closely similar, and what you're measuring with x-rays is essentially the electron density. So there's this tiny little blip here. So you almost don't see that, uh, and because you almost don't see that, you measure exactly this thing that I showed you a few views ago, ago this thing here. In other words, this, uh, period, this thing here, which is just a single layer. So, um, uh, you, what you measure with x-rays is this thing which is, corresponds almost to a single layer. If you do it with, um, with, that, with neutrons, you, you see that the fact that this is the polyvinyl pyridine is deuterated and, the, and this thing is hydrogenated gives you a huge difference in the, in the scattering length density uh, contrast or, or the contrast between those two layers. And then you get, you get um, something which uh, this long period here that is typical of this total distance, the total film difference thickness, and then these little things here, which is typical of the, actually the inverse, sorry, I said that the wrong way around. These, these, these oscillations here, which are, ti uh, are typical, which are a reflection of the full thickness of this layer, um, why are the, why are the uh, why are the oscillations of shorter shorter q because the distance is bigger remember that q is sort of goes inversely as the distance and then these long period layers uh, oscillations here are a reflection of this shorter distance that, that, that that's uh, in the sample so um, you know x rays can often overcome this disadvantage because they have so many uh, x rays to start with Right, uh, and so the small contrast may not be uh, a, a really bad effect. But what I wanted to show you here is that there can, even though you have far flu fewer neutrons available than you have X-rays available, there are situations in which you can do uh, a good job with neutrons. So um, uh, let's not bother with that. <laughs>
That's not too good. That's an, that's an x-ray reflectometer at the APS. Some of you have seen those things. Just, uh, okay. So I want to spend the last few minutes uh, talking about um, uh, inelastic scattering because I haven't said anything about inelastic scattering up until now. I've just talked about uh, uh, stru uh, uh, structure. So uh, in, uh, uh, in real life, the atoms in a crystal don't just sit on official lattice sites and, 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 and uh, not move. In real life, they move around. And they move around because there are um, uh, phonons in the, in the crystal which propagate, which carry um, energy uh, through the crystal and which cause uh, vibrations of the atom. Uh, in this particular case, I've drawn uh, a unit cell which has uh, two types of atoms in it. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the red ones and the blue ones. And I've actually, I think, only put two waves in this, two, two different uh, um, uh, uh, wavelength waves in this. So in, 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 in fact, there will be f uh, phonons of many different wavelengths and many different frequencies, so the thing won't look like this at all. But at least it gives you the notion that the, uh, the atoms can move around. So what happens if you do, if you want to measure that? Well, other, rather than measuring elastic scattering, you have to measure inelastic scattering. Inelastic scattering because the neutron is either going to give up energy to the crystal and excite a phonon, or the phonon is going to give the neutron a kick uh, when it, when it, and, and, uh, by having its energy absorbed by the neutron. So we, we saw earlier that uh, the scattering triangle for elastic scattering is just an isosceles triangle because the incident and the um, final wave vectors have the same magnitude. In the case of, incident, in the case of inelastic scattering, the triangle has a, can have you know, pretty much any shape you like, uh, although I did talk about these kinematic limitations um, that uh, you have uh, where, you, where you can't make the triangle. But here you can see that the neutron has lost energy. The exit wave vector is shorter than the incident wave energy. Here you can, you can see that the neutron has gained energy because it's been kicked up in energy by a, phon uh, a phonon. So what, what you've got to do if you want to make these measurements is you've got to be able to measure what the incident and the scattered wave vectors are as well as measure what the intensity of the scattering is. Um, what you'll get out of this is very similar to what you get out of, of, of the elastic scattering. And, and uh, the, the expressions are quite complicated, and I'll show you a couple of them in a minute, but uh, I want to tell you in words what you actually measure. So remember, if you measure elastic coherence scattering, that's what we've been talking about up to now, where you saw this thing, d sigma d omega, what that measures is the spatial Fourier transform of the static pair correlation function. I showed you that, right? That's what you measure when you're measuring elastic scattering. What you measure when you're measuring inelastic scattering is a sort of generalization of this. So if you're inelastic and coherent, what you measure is the space and time, not just the space for spatial Fourier transform, but the space and time Fourier transform of a time-dependent correlation function. What does that mean? Remember, the static pair correlation function was put an atom at the origin of the coordinate system, measure what the probability is that there's another atom distance r away. The, the, this, this correlation function here is the probability if I have an atom at the origin at time zero, I will have another atom at position r at time t. That's what you're measuring. So it's a, it's a, it's a correlation in, 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 in in space and time, and then you just Fourier transform that to get the intensity that you're measuring. If you measure incoherent scattering, then you only measure the, the you measure the correlation between the position of an atom at time zero and itself at time t. So, what is the probability that if I have an atom at time zero at the origin of my correlation uh, of my um, coordination system? 
what is the probability that at time t that same atom will be at position r? Right? So they're just generalization, term, the generalizations of the of the correlation function that you that you saw in the elastic case. And, th and that's what you're measuring when you measure inelastic scattering. And, and it's, worth, it's worth sort of remembering this because it gives you, it'll give you an idea of what, 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 what is being measured in, in various measurements. And it's probably better to remember this than any of the multiple expressions that, 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 that can be obtained. Um, I've gotten to quarter two, is that right? Yes, so I'm going to race through. Um, so what do you get when you do this inelastic scattering? You can measure things called phonon dispersion curves. That tells you what the energy, that's what's plotted vertically here, of the, f of the particular phonon is as a function of its wave vector in different directions in the CRISPR. And this was a sort of cottage industry in the early days of neutron scattering, and it was for this that Brockhaus got his, this type of work that Brockhaus got his share of the Nobel Prize in 1994 was a measure of phonon dispersion curves. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. You can measure um, different types of phonons, optic phonons, acoustic phonons. Uh, uh, you can um, play with that. Uh, you, these, as I said, these general expressions get to be very complicated. Uh, they're even more complicated if you care about quantum mechanics because these things here are not really just positions, they're, they're Heisenberg operators. And so the whole thing gets uh, excruciatingly complicated. So I would not try to figure this out. I'd try to remember these, these uh, um, things in terms of correlation functions. As you can see, it gets really nasty expressions. Uh, let's not do that. Let's not do that. I want to just touch on one last thing, which is magnetic scattering. Um, uh, w the, as I told you, the neutron has a magnetic moment, so it can be scattered by the B fields inside a material, the, the fields due to unpaired electrons. Uh, and there's, um, s there's some things here that are important. Um, because of the dipole nature of the interaction of the neutron with magnetization, it turns out that the neutron only sees the component of magnetization in the crystal, which is perpendicular to the scattering vector. That, that's what this symbol here is. And that's something, if you're doing magnetic scattering, that you have to remember. It doesn't see, the neutron is, does not, is not sensitive to all components of the magnetization in the crystal, only to the component that's perpendicular to the Q, the Q vector. Uh, and that and that will restrict your choice of scattering geometries. Uh, there's a some math derivation if you care. Um, the the basically the cross section for for magnetic magnetic scattering is very similar to the one for nuclear scattering, except that you have different thing different Bs, different scattering lengths. But apart from that, and apart from this piece about the the, the only the magnetization perpendicular to the Q vector counting, the expression is essentially exactly the same. And then the final thing I want to say is that magnetic scattering, um, you can also probe using polarized neutrons. I haven't talked about polarized neutrons, but, by l but, but um, you, can, you can make a beam which has, uh, w which neutrons are polarized in which all of the magnetic moments point in the same direction and then you can use that for scattering. And then uh, depending upon the type of magnetic scattering that you have from your system, the polarization of the neutron will behave in different ways when it's scattered. So rather than simply measuring the, the change in direction of the neutron and the change in energy of the neutron, you measure those two quantities and the change in the spin polarization of the neutron and that can give you additional information about the magnetism in the material. Uh, and I think that's about it. Uh, so uh, these are some references. Um, uh, this one is, is probably the best book that's been written on, on scattering. It's very pedagogical. Uh, I don't think I've ever found an error in it. This guy was my PhD supervisor, by the way. <laughs>
There's some, uh, there's a little primer that's available if you care. This is another really beautiful book by uh, Yonsef Nielsen and Des McMorrow on, on X-ray scattering. And then there's a slightly, simpl uh, somewhat simplified version uh, of scattering theory, which is uh, written by Davinda Sivia, uh, which is also worth reading. All right, with that, uh, one question, and I'm out of here. Do you have any questions? Sorry, shouldn't have said it that way. But seriously, if you have, uh, we have one minute, I think, if there's a burning question. Yeah, I'm trying to get to the airport. Yes. Is that ever used when? That's an interesting question. There has been some looking at um, uh, magnetic scattering in oxygen, solid oxygen, uh, to, um, to change the energies of, 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 of ultra-cold neutrons. Um, but that's the only thing I'm aware of in that, in that realm. But in principle, it's no different from, from nuclear scattering, right? Generally, because the, because the hydrogen um, uh, is something I haven't talked about, but you can sort of think about it as the hydrogen is light. Mm -hmm. And so when the neutron collides with hydrogen, it's just like billiard balls, right? It's going to share its energy with the, new, with, the, with the light hydrogen and slow down more than if the, if the uh, atom it collided with had a heavy w was heavy. Uh, and so generally, light materials are preferred for moderation. So there are two things you have to consider is the, 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 the mass of the, of the atom you're striking and the scattering cross-section. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say it that way. I would say that uh, the, the atomic weight matters in both cases. Um, um, bec I mean, it's just like, you know, um, if you run into another another cyclist on your bike, both of you will scatter, whereas if you run into a bus, the bus is going to be relatively unaffected, whatever your speed was. <laughs> right? uh, you on the other side might, might not be so good. And so that you have to consider that. Any other questions? All right, we'll have a great school. I know you'll be exhausted at the end, but I hope you will learn lots, and I hope that you will come back and use both this facility and the APS. And I look forward to reading your papers once I know all your ORCID numbers. All right, thank you.